Well, first of all, I, I'm going to explain uh, exactly what this is. I don't know how many people here uh, already heard about DNS or HTTPS. I think several heard about it, but maybe not everyone really knows what it is about. So the, the first thing is, is that I want to start with is a, a general framing, uh, because this really depends on where your DNS is being provided. So who is providing you the service of uh, DNS, so name resolution for uh, using the internet? Uh, because if you if you don't need names, of course, you can just connect by an IP address. So you, you we take the typical case of a user that sits on a home network. They usually buy internet access from an ISP, uh, and then through the network of the ISP, they get to the internet. And if you have the IP address, you just go directly and get all the way to your destination. But then, of course, people don't want to use IP addresses, and this is why the names came in. So the DNS was invented in the 80s because people would like to use names to connect to, to places. And so there, there is basically a, a hierarchical set of, of resolutions. A resolution is the operation of converting a name into a, an IP address, and in the end you contact an authoritative DNS server and to ask for the IP address that corresponds to the, to the name. So the, the point, however, is how do you do this? So you could, in theory, just do this yourself. So your own device, your own computer could do your, the DNS resolution on their own, so they could have a full <laughs> DNS resolver in, in the operating system, and this piece of software basically would connect directly with, to the authoritative DNS servers of the domain names that you want to reach, and you wouldn't need anyone doing DNS resolutions for you. But unfortunately, this is not how it works, for a number of reasons, which um, mostly have to do with the complexity of, uh, of a DNS resolver, and also some optimizations that you can get if you have something in the middle, as a server that does the resolution for you. And, and so this is how it usually happens. So this is the, let's say, traditional architecture for resolving uh, names over the internet. Uh, whatever you do over the internet, as long as you use a name, so connecting to a website, connecting to your email server, whatever you do goes through a DNS resolution. And uh, what, usually what happens is that when you configure your device to access the internet or, or when you connect to the network, you enter a, a name server, usually called by the user or resolver in DNS speak more precisely. And this is a server that is usually provided by your ISP, so by the local network that you use to, to go through to go to the internet. And so this is what we, we will call local DNS resolution because it's done on, on the local network, on the immediate uh, network that is connecting your device to the rest of the internet. And so your operating system only has a stub resolver, so a very simple piece of software that just connects to the other, so to the other, uh, to the resolver, and, and the resolver will do everything and, and send you back the, the reply. And the stub resolver is in the operating system, so it's just the same piece of software for all the applications in your, in your device. So this is local. This is local because it's the, I mean, that's the, the nearest piece of the internet that you have uh, in respect to, to your home. But it's also local in uh, juridical and uh, cultural, social business terms. So the ISP through, through which you, you get your internet connection is usually in your same country uh, or even in the same city. They speak your language. You have a contract with them. So you know how to reach them. They can provide a service for you. If something doesn't work, you can call them. And so they can fix the internet access for you. While this is the newer way of resolving names. Newer, but still it's been in place like for 10, 15 years. So this is the remote DNS resolution model. In a, it means that the, you, the name server that you are using is not on your, provided by your ISP and is not on your local network anymore. So it's still a name server. It's uh, similar to the other one, but it's somewhere over the internet provided by a third party. So what happens is that your stub resolver will now connect through the network of your ISP and go to, I mean, to the, out there to the internet. And, uh, and so it will talk to the resolver which is on the internet and then, and then the resolver will do the resolution for you and send back the results. So this is remote. And this remote DNS resolution model has quite some differences because the server now is, is in another country and there is no relation between the local network, so the, the network and the provider that is giving you internet access and the, the people that are resolving the names for you. So it could be, typically it's a, it's a free resolver. The most famous one is Quad8, so 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, which is provided freely by Google. Uh, these are people you don't have a contract with, uh, so you, you haven't acquired a service, you don't have any clear conditions of service, so you, you just configure the name server and that's it. 
In some cases, there's even a paid premium service, so you want to get a better DNS service for whatever reason or different one, and so you buy a service from, for example, OpenDNS, which is a provider of similar services. So this difference between local and remote is really important to understand the issues that we will be discussing. So in terms of usage, these were the latest statistics that were presented like one month ago at the uh, DNS symposium organized by ICANN, and they show that now, I mean, remote resolution is really gaining ground. So we're, they, they said up to 40%, that this is, is really depending by country. I'm pretty sure in Europe it's less than that, could be 20, 25. It, there are parts of the world like, uh, I mean, many developing countries where the local infrastructure is bad and everyone is using Google. So, I mean, it really depends on where you are. But, I mean, still the local resolution model is by far the, the most common way of resolving names over the Internet, for, especially for the average non-technical consumer. So, then we get to DOH. So, what is DOH? DOH is the, the short form for DNS over HTTPS which is a, a new standard that was released uh, less than one year ago by the ITF. It was uh, spearheaded by the web people, so it's, it doesn't come from the DNS or ISP or telco community. It was basically conceived by the web people and the public resolver operators. And what it does is that it transmits your DNS queries, so your requests for I mean, converting names into addresses, over an HTTPS connection. And so they are encrypted because they are basically encapsulated within an HTTPS request. And so any application that is able to send and receive HTTPS requests now can very easily send their DNS queries to wherever they want. And it can completely bypass the operating system and the name server that has been configured in the operating system by the user or by the local network when you connect to it. Of course, this is a, a different protocol, so it requires you to upgrade the DNS server or the web server, so it's not immediate. There, there needs to be an action by the industry to deploy this. But it's still, I mean, it's already under deployment, and we'll, we'll see this. And so, I mean, maybe you're wondering, isn't DNS encrypted already? Because you know that we are in the middle of a trend to encrypt everything, which is uh, connected to privacy and security reasons. And DNS is still one of the protocols that are not encrypted. It was not conceived uh, as an encrypted protocol, first of all, because it's a very basic protocol that was invented in the 80s, when encryption was basically a military weapon, restricted, and so on. And uh, anyway, the, the, the effort for, I mean, in terms of CPU load would be, I mean, at the time would be impossible to, to bear. There, there is some cryptography. You might have heard about DNSSEC, which is a security extension to DNS, but DNSSEC, uh, uh, uses cryptography to ensure that DNS records cannot be modified when you receive them. So they are still transmitted in an unencrypted way, so they can still be basically seen by anyone over the piece of network that your connection is traversing. Uh, so, but, uh, but at least they are signed so that they cannot be modified. And uh, so it's a different thing. So often there is some confusion, but it's, uh, I mean, it has a different purpose. And, uh, and there are some other protocols to encrypt the DNS connection, like DNS over TLS or DNS script, that they are not widely used. So still, uh, the, the very, by far the common way is to send stuff around unencrypted. So the DOH introduces three main changes to the resolution process. So the first one is this encryption part. So the connection is now encrypted so that uh, no one in the middle can actually read your queries but it's also hidden inside web traffic. So since the, it uses HTTPS, it's the same protocol that is used by your browser to connect to websites. And actually, one of the design features of this protocol is that uh, uh, they say, that, uh, for example, Google, Google could run the DNS uh, resolver under www.google.com at the same IP address so that the, the traffic that you send to the DNS resolver is mixed with the rest of the web traffic that you send to Google for search, for example. And this uh, makes it uh, impossible even to know that you are using this kind of DNS resolution. So it's, it, it hides uh, completely your, uh, your DNS traffic to the ISP and to, I mean, all the network in between. The second change is that now each application can use a different resolver. So DNS until now has been a network service. So something, I mean, you, you, you get as part of the network service and it's the same for all the applications that run on your device. With, with DOH, it becomes very easy for each application to do their own DNS query. So if they want, they cannot use the operating system level DNS uh, resolver. They can just send queries to something, I mean, some other place. And so different applications can resolve queries to different places. And the third part is that now, since it's the application that is doing the DNS resolution, 
the application maker gains some control on the choice of the resolver of the DNS server that is used for the resolution. And uh, in, in some cases, there is actually a hardwiring of the remote resolvers list. So the application maker decides which name service you are allowed to use. And if you want to use a different one, you're out of luck. So the first one is the only one that is common with the previous protocols, so DNS over TLS, the previous encryption protocols. But the other ones are protocol, I mean, are, are new. The first two are protocol design choices, so they are embedded in the way the protocol is made. They are unavoidable given the way that the protocol is made. The third one is a deployment choice. So it, it can happen or can not happen depending on what the, each application maker wants to do. And this is where there is a lot of discussion now, which is related exactly to the deployment policies that have been chosen by several application makers and especially browser makers, since now the web is basically most of what you do over the internet. So I hope everything is clear, I mean, unless you have, sorry. The consequences of deploying DOH uh, in policy terms are quite far-reaching. Well, the, the first one, the encryption, I think is not problematic. So th there's really not a lot of uh, argument about encrypting the connection. So what they are trying to do is that they are trying to protect the connection, especially if for people that are already using remote resolvers. Because if, if, if you use a remote resolver, your DNS query will go unencrypted throughout a, a good stretch of the Internet because the resolver can be very far from you. And so if you have someone in the middle of the internet that can put a server and uh, sniff your traffic, uh, intercept your traffic, like some agency, were, uh, for example, governmental agencies were known that, I mean, doing, uh, th then they can really see all your traffic. And so they can see basically everything you do over the internet. And so this is clearly bad. And so this is the scenario that, uh, that uh, the encryption part is going to prevent. While, I mean, if you are using a local resolver, this is not really so important for you because the local resolver is really near to you in topological terms. It's just a couple of network hops from your, your device. So unless the, the attacker is inside your ISP's network, I mean, this, the fact that this connection is encrypted doesn't really change a lot because it's, uh, it's anyway very, very, almost impossible, very hard unless you are the ISP. Sorry. I know. To, to actually intercept the connection. But the other scenario that this technology is trying to prevent is this one. This is a, an increasingly common scenario in, in several countries, including in Europe, in which you actually configure a remote resolver in, in your device. So you want to use Google, for example, to resolve your names. But the ISP has a, sorry, this is moving on its own. <laughs> the ISP has a, um, a transparent proxy, so a, a server that is in the middle of these connections, and since the data are unencrypted, they can just intercept your attempts to communicate with Google, for example, and they can then can see that the traffic, they can actually block uh, what they don't like, they can uh, filter it out, and they can apply policies, uh, national laws, or whatever. And this, of course, this is not liked by the browser makers and by the people that operate at the remote resolvers. So they want to make it impossible for ISPs to apply any policy to the traffic that is not directed at them. And so is this, I mean, this encryption, is it a good or a bad thing? I think it really depends on the use case, and you will see this a lot. So it's basically impossible to say this new technology is good or bad in general. It really depends on who you are and what you want to do and, what's it, uh, and what is uh, it, its use case. So if you are a user of, the rem of a remote resolver, this is definitely a good thing for you. It, it helps you reach the resolver without anyone I mean, blocking your traffic, sorry. And, uh, and also if you don't trust your ISP, it's good for you because it shuts your ISP out of, of your traffic. And, and if you roam a lot, if you move up across different uh, networks, maybe you don't trust the local network if it's a hotel or whatever. On the other hand, if you're a user of a local resolver or if you like your ISP, this is actually indifferent or even bad for you. So, I mean, this is preventing your ISP from checking your traffic, which is often done for good reasons, like protecting you from infections and malware and so on. So we will see that. So it's really a matter of who, who you are and, and which DNS resolver you want to use. The second con uh, change that we saw is that uh, now each application can use a different resolver. And this is instead, uh, I mean, opening a, a can of worms. So, it, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's actually good if the application is smarter than you. So, I mean, uh, Mozilla, who has been championing this technology, says that maybe we can choose a better resolver than the user because the user is not technical, and we can choose one very private, very secure, very good resolver for them. And this is true, I mean, if, if you have a, an application maker that you can trust or if you don't trust your operating system or the, the settings that are in your operating systems or whatever. 
But I mean, it's bad if, on the other hand, you have an application maker that is dishonest or not not really doing your interest. So if you have a, someone that does an application and wants to track you, they could really just direct the DNS queries somewhere else and uh, get all your data on all your, your surfing or whatever activities you do. And if you are a smart user and you really want to control your, your queries, then you're uh, again you're out of luck if the application decides to send them somewhere else. And uh, there are but, uh, several more, I mean, troubling uh, situations. So, for example, in the policy space, what is potentially problematic is that uh, you could start getting uh, different uh, IP addresses for the same name because if different uh, applications start sending your DNS queries to different servers, then they could get different replies depending on the local policies, on blocking, not blocking, but also on for example, uh, content delivery network optimizations that would send you to different places for the same name. And uh, so, I mean, this is risks uh, creating a mess in which maybe in some applications you, you can reach at a certain destination and the same name in another application doesn't work. And it's even worse if you think at the namespace and all the policies surrounding the namespace, like icons, policies, and so on, because <coughs> each application in theory can now control the namespace and say we are going to add our own TLD to the resolution and we're going to resolve it ourselves uh, or so on. Or on the other hand, we, we're going to block some TLDs that we don't like. And uh, then there's the third one. The third one is uh, the fact that the application maker now controls the, the resolver choice. And this is really the, the core of the discussion. So this was, uh, I mean, this started when Mozilla, uh, one year ago, announced that they wanted to enable this new technology in Firefox. And they wanted to do this by default. So not really, I mean, asking users to do it, but just saying, are you okay if we turn on this as a better DNS way, more private, more secure? And so, we, and, the, and the point is that they also made a deal with Cloudflare, which is a big uh, uh, global uh, CDN provider to run the DNS server that would then be used by this new technology. So basically this, uh, this is uh, again meant that uh, when they would turn this on, all the DNS queries would start, uh, for all Firefox users all around the world, would start going to Cloudflare, no matter which DNS server was configured in, in the operating system. So they haven't actually done this yet. There's been a lot of discussion, so they're still working this out, and now they say they will do it, but maybe just in certain parts of the world. And what they came up with is the resolver accreditation policy, so they also said they now want to have more than one resolver choice. So they actually said if other people want to run DNS or HTTPS server that, that can be used by Firefox users, they have to go through this accreditation process. So we are going to see if we accept them, and we will accept them if they meet uh, a number of requirements in terms of privacy. So some are actually, actually pretty good ones, like not storing the data, not giving, out, uh, giving it out to third parties, and so on. But what's happening, I mean, also in the initial implementation, I mean, on the right, you see the configuration scheme for Bromite, which is a derivative of Google Chrome. So it's a browser that is, I mean, really focused on privacy. And what they do is basically that they don't even let you choose your server. So they give you, I mean, the option to disable DNS or HTTPS, or just you can pick among I mean, Google, Cloudflare, or Quad9. So three big uh, global uh, operator uh, or public resolvers. And, and this is, I mean, so if you wanted a different one, you, you're out of luck again. And so this is the, the real change. So in the, in the current traditional model, still local resolution made by the local ISP is the default. So it's what you get if you just connect to a local Wi-Fi network or whatever. You get a, a nearest resolver, and you can set the res your resolver in your operating system. So if you want a different one, you can go there, change it, and it will apply to all your applications. So in, in this new version, I under this deployment model, uh, the remote resolution will be the default. So the default will be to send all your queries to a global resolver somewhere over the internet, which is decided basically by the application maker. And uh, if you want to change this, you have to change this once per every application. So you have f 50 apps on your phone, you have to set the DNS server in 50 places, unless we can come up with some ideas, for example, policies or ideas to make it so that the user can set it just once, which is part of this discussion. So. This has a, a lot of policy impacts on a lot of different things, that, and some of them are not really immediate. So, but the most immediate one, and, uh, which is uh, currently being discussed at the ITF as well, is concentration. So what happens now is that, I mean, uh, DNS traffic is really spread across uh, hundreds of thousands of servers. I mean, <coughs> basically, every ISP has one or more. 
I mean, there is some mild concentration, but I mean, again, recent data show that uh, to get to 95% of the DNS traffic of the world, you have to put together the top 1,000 resolvers. So it's still a pretty good distribution. Of course, we, we saw that Google has one third of that, but the other ones are really small. And they are <coughs> all around the planet, so in different countries, different places, and you can pick whatever. In this model in which the application controls the DNS resolution, then for browsers, the situation is dire because there are four browser makers that control over 90% of the world's uh, web traffic. And so, and by the way, they are all in a single country, in a single jurisdiction. So this is really creating a, a concentration and, and potential control point. And it's very hard to, <coughs> to imagine that this is going to be different in the future. So there have always been uh, very few browsers dominating the market. Maybe the, the dominating one changes, but there's always one that is dominating the market. And uh, then there is the discussion about privacy. So this technology was proposed to have more privacy, and indeed it does in terms of transport. So your queries cannot be intercepted anymore. And this is uh, definitely one of the advantages, and we should actually make good use of this. Uh, the problem is that if you are changing the, the place where the queries are resolved, you're changing the jurisdiction. So if, if now you are in Europe and you're using your local ISPs uh, server, you're covered by GDPR, basically. If your data starts to be sent uh, outside of the European Union, then different laws apply and they might not cover you that well. And uh, also, the ISPs are companies that uh, don't live usually of target advertising. I mean, you're buying internet access, you're paying them to get access, including the DNS server, and that's mostly what they do. And also in Europe, they cannot really monetize this data. It's forbidden by law. While the global platforms, in a good part, are companies that live off tracking people. So they say, of course, they commit to not to use this data for user tracking, but uh, in the long term, uh, I mean, this doesn't look likely, honestly. So it looks likely that this will be yet another way for the big internet platforms to have more data about the browsing attitudes uh, of people. And in terms of censorship, this is also potentially a very good technology, especially if you live in an in a authoritarian country because this is going to basically bypass whatever DNS-based content filters that are in place in your country. So if your country uses DNS to block some destinations, then this is going away. And, uh, and this is good, uh, especially if you don't like filtering. So of course the ITF's mindset is that no filter is ever good, not just the authoritarian ones, but even the ones that we have in Europe on, let's say, child pornography and or the illegal content or this kind of, I mean, counterfeit medicines, uh, illegal gambling, a uh, lot, lot of stuff that is filtered in different European countries depending on the local laws. So this is going to disrupt all of this, as long as it's based on the DNS. And, but on the other hand, you now get any DNS-based content filters in the resolver's country. So if the resolver's country, let's say the US government uh, passes a, a law that says uh, that uh, certain TLDs have to be blocked, that certain companies have to be made unreachable, then now you will be subject to the resolver's country censorship. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the fear is also that this will create pressure, even in Europe, uh, to, for other ways of filtering the internet uh, access. So if, if, I mean, DNS filtering is a mild way of filtering things uh, that is uh, easily bypassable by smart users and still is not over-invasive, it's pretty precise in what it filters. So it, it's a good compromise between not filtering anything and being very heavily filtering. Uh, if this goes away, the fear is that now the ISPs will be forced to apply like firewalls or even the packet inspection or other ways of doing this that is going to be much more invasive <laughs> in the end and, and problematic for the users. Same for network neutrality. Again, uh, there are ISPs that are breaking network neutrality and this is bad. And so this can prevent ISPs from breaking uh, network neutrality, but on the other hand, now the application maker or the resolver operator could break network neutrality. So it really depends on the jurisdiction where this happens and whether network neutrality is protected or not. Then there's some, a discussion about performance. Performance really depends. If you have a local service which is very well performing, maybe it's, it's better because it's near, but in, some, in several cases, the remote resolvers are actually quicker and perform better. There's a, a problem with uh, CDNs, content delivery networks, because if your resolver is local, I mean, it can give you the nearest server from the content delivery network without actually having to forward information about you. So if you, I mean, your ISP will, will get a, a localized content delivery server and they don't need to tell who you are to the CDN. While a remote resolver 
has to form forward the information to the CDN on who you are and where you come from. Otherwise, the CDN cannot choose the proper server. And if they decide not to do this to protect your privacy, then you're going to get a, a slow connection to the content delivery networks. So security. Well, security is one of the biggest issues now because this DNS uh, monitoring of queries is increasingly used by ISPs for network security issues, both to secure the local network and to secure the user. So many ISPs now have, I mean, check the DNS queries that you send to the local resolver. They have a list of uh, current botnet uh, control, command and control centers, malware websites, phishing websites. So if they see that you are trying to connect to a, a, one of these websites, they will stop the connection and they will prevent your, you from connecting to a malware website or a phishing website. And they can also use this monitoring as one of the ways uh, to, to, to check what's happening on the network. And this is especially important in the IoT world, because in the traditional, uh, let's say, computer mobile world, you can install antivirus software or whatever on your mobile. So that's an alternative. With IoT, you cannot install uh, the, the kind of software on a smart bulb or a smart fridge or whatever. So you really have to rely on the network to check what's happening and detecting network problems. And th this is going to be a way. So the ISP is going to become completely blind on uh, where, you, where the users are going. And, and so and, and also there are several security devices, for, especially for corporate networks like uh, so-called split horizons or names that only work locally, internal say, intranet names. These are also are going not to work anymore if, uh, if the application, the browser, connects to a different DNS server. So, so I mean, there, there's still some analysis going on and some studies, but there, are, there is a lot of concern about security, cybersecurity effects of, of this technology. And finally, there's the discussion about user empower, empowerment. So the discussion is uh, basically who should choose the DNS server. So, I mean, Today, the user can basically choose their server. You need to be a little technical, but most users have learned over time to at least change the DNS server if they want. And there are also several DNS-based services that people choose and opt in. So, I mean, parental control, for example, is uh, often done this way. So people that want to block certain, let's say, adult websites from their home network because they have kids, they do this by acquiring, I mean, setting some special DNS servers and acquiring the servers, the, the service. And uh, this is stopping to work. And so in the future, if uh, the, the kid just downloads Firefox and turns it on and it uses a different DNS server, then all the adult websites will, will be visible. And, uh, and so there, there is some discussion of, on whether this is actually empowering the user or not. And uh, in general, uh, this is also not very well understood yet. So there is, I mean, outside of the technical community, there's not a lot of discussion on this and users don't really know what's happening. So the, the key points that I, I, I want to make is that the discussion is about privacy, but uh, it's not really just about privacy of the transport of the queries or encryption, but privacy in general, and that's the approach that should be discussed. There is a potential risk that if you create some concentration and you reduce the opportunities for the users to control their DNS queries, you will actually be creating one potential surveillance point and single point of failure and so on. And uh, the other point is that uh, this is potentially a, a technology that creates uh, more freedom for the user, especially users that are in very heavily censored parts of the world. But in the end, uh, you are just changing the entity in charge. So it's not like you're creating freedom by uh, self-sovereign, whatever, or this kind of stuff. You're just uh, putting other people, other companies in charge of, of um, controlling the, the traffic and the DNS resolution. And uh, so you have to hope, I and mean, you can hope that they can give you more freedom, but it's not like uh, I mean, freedom-making technology. So in the end, is this good or bad? It really depends who you are. So it possibly, if you, uh, if you are in a, an authoritarian country, this is better. If you don't trust your ISP, which is the case, by the way, often in the US itself. So if you trust the, the big internet platforms more than your ISP, then this is good, because it's uh, shifting the, the control over the connection. If you like the idea of uh, all of this happening in the US, this is good. On the other hand, if you trust your ISP more, if you trust your local uh, jurisdiction more, if you are worried about the ongoing centralization of the net, this is not uh, a good news. But, but the point that I really want to make is that in good part, this depends on the policies. So this is why now the discussion has to move from the ITF into the policy realm. Because, uh, I mean, for example, if you had policies that uh, the applications still have to use the local resolver, then this, many of these concerns will go away. 
So I mean, the, the discussion really has to be on uh, can can we do policies and how can we convince everyone to sit at the table and and make good ones. So I would like to now to open the discussion and I would li like to leave you with three questions. Then if more people want to have more, more questions, of course they are welcome. But the, the first question for discussion is uh, who has uh, control over the devices resolver? So uh, is it the user in the end? And so should the user always do this? Because there are some other people, uh, both, uh, both in the network community and especially in the browser community, that say that the user is not technical enough. So the application has the duty of choosing <laughs> the resolver on behalf of the user because they, uh, the, the application makers are, are better informed. The second question is uh, who should be entitled to apply policies? Policies means uh, anything from filtering out malware to filtering out uh, websites that are n not liked or illegal or considered inappropriate. And so is there the right of uh, any of these parties to apply policies? So should the government have a way, to, I mean, your government or as a citizen of the county or citizen of, have a way to uh, impose policies or filtering policies to your DNS? Uh, and even if it, it, this is uh, maybe done at the global level by a public resolver platform, or is the resolver itself, uh, I mean, should they, should they be able to apply policies, for example, for network security, and same for the network administrator? If they decide that they want to make some content uh, inaccessible, should they be allowed to do so at the DNS level? And the third question is, uh, where do we have this discussion? Because the discussion now, it has mostly happened at the ITF, so it's been a very technical discussion, and it's been very informed by the values of the IDF, which are a specific, let's say, West Coast libertarian values. And in other parts of the world, this is just starting to happen. And I think in other parts of the world, there are different views. And so this, where do we put uh, all the stakeholders together and where do we have, do we have this discussion? So thank you.